Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! We will find out later in the programme whether it really is. We're also going to return to that gender selection story. Um, some people perhaps worry about doing these stories because they do appear to sort of separate some minorities or cultures, as we're supposed to say these days, from the mainstream or the most uh, populous. You really don't need to worry. You're having a conversation about human beings, some of whom are still enslaved by the notion that a boy child is preferable to a girl child. There's nothing racist about discussing this or pointing it out, even if it is now more or less confined to certain ethnic or religious minorities. Anybody who thinks it is, you just need to remind them the only reason that the Church of England exists is because Henry VIII thought that a boy child was vastly superior to a girl child. So... Stick that in your doublet and hose and smoke it. We'll be going on to that later in the programme with that very important caveat that uh, anyone hoping to use it as an opportunity to bang their racist drum will have to explain to me why Henry VIII should have been deported. Um, but we begin with the subject that entices and excites you the most. One of the few corners of the British media that has got absolutely nothing wrong since the moment that Brexit result was reported. Every syllable of our analysis, every iota of our predictions have come true. And they continue to do so, with the only mystery now remaining why so many people whose promises have been broken and whose predictions have been fundamentally and categorically disproved, why now they can't admit it. There's two topics we're going to do on Brexit this week, minimum, possibly more. The, the, the one that's really bubbling under the surface, as you know, is the question of what that side think motivates the other side. It suddenly occurred to me, I've dedicated huge amounts of coverage and contemplation to, to the mystery of what motivates people who still want to leave, despite now knowing that none of the things they said they were voting for are ever going to happen. But we've devoted very, very little to the other side. The, the, the idea, Gina Miller, of course, um, it, it, it has seen people sent to jail for the vileness of their threats against her. The question of what on earth people on the leave side, the, 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 not, not the capped offers and the forelock tuggers, the, the normal, nice, decent, thoughtful people, what do they think motivates the other side? And actually, why not talk to the capped offers and the forelock tuggers? You, you, if you are the kind of person who spends your days uh, breathing halitosis-ridden vitriol all over um, educated, thoughtful, intelligent people who are constantly explaining evidence and facts. Why, why do you think they're doing it? Why do you think they're doing it? It's a question that occurred to me this morning when Bernard Jenkin, who seems to have um, come from the back of the pack as one of the few people that's prepared to go on television and radio to defend this unfolding nonsense. He's back in the frame today, and he has claimed on... Um, uh, uh, one radio station this morning that the head of Jaguar Land Rover... These are the moments where, where you pause and think, how, this is, this is home? This is home? This isn't some weird fictional dystopia or some banana republic on the other side of the world. This is home. And we've got a, a, a politician, an elected politician on the telly, saying that he thinks the head of ja Jaguar Land Rover, when he describes what will happen in the event of no deal, the head of Jaguar Land Rover is making it up. And, and it, it, it occurred to me, why would he make it up? What, what, is the, what is the thought, what is the castle in the mind of the Brexiter that they think explains the deliberate deceit of someone like the head of Jaguar Land Rover? So just off the top of my head, three prominent Brexit supporters. Him, accusing the head of Jaguar Land Rover of lying. <sighs> Michael Gove, apparently yesterday on the telly, trying to make a virtue of unreliability and dishonesty, effectively saying, well, we can agree to stuff now, but then we can renege on it later. I mean, that's the opposite of British fair play. I think the one thing we can all agree on now, whether you're still howling at the moon or whether you're finally recognising the insanity of Brexit or whether, like me, you've been increasingly aware of it all along... I think we can all agree, can't we, that this notion of the British sense of fair play or the idea that there's anything remotely patriotic about chopping our arms off at the elbow is palpably absurd. 
But Michael Gove yesterday has been boxed by his own idiocy and dissembling into such an uncomfortable corner that he's effectively now trying to tell his core support, don't panic because we could be untrustworthy and dishonest and everything would be all right. Imagine going into the most important negotiation in recent history. Arguably, I mean, the end of the Second World War involved negotiations of sorts, but really Suez is the only thing that stands comparison. I'd say this was bigger than Suez. You, you could make a case for arguing that this is the biggest and most important uh, supranational negotiation involving the United Kingdom since the Treaty of Versailles. So you're looking at exactly 100 years. I'll just make a note of that because I've got to do another one of those big pieces for the TLS next month. Treaty of Versailles. Uh, yeah. So ex almost to the day, 100 years. And Michael Gove, a, a cabinet minister, a cabinet minister no less, is if effectively appearing on the television to tell people that if we do reach an agreement with our negotiating partners, then don't worry if you don't like it, because we can break all our promises and renege on all our agreements at some point subsequently. That doesn't, to my untutored eye, send out an incredibly confident message to potential trading partners in the future, does it? Well, well, we are the United Kingdom, not only, as Dominic Raab tried to claim last week, not only will we not pay our bills, not only will we run away like a kind of absconding tenant in the middle of the night who still owns six months' rent and doesn't act... This is it. This is Dominic Raab's Brexit, right? Dominic Raab's Brexit is we haven't... We're, we're going to skip on the last year's rent, we're going to disappear in the middle of the night, and we don't know where we're going to be living tomorrow. But vote for me, because it's a really good idea and the will of the people. So let's stick Rob on the list as well. Who did I start with? Jenkin? Gove? He's the one saying that being dishonest and untrustworthy is somehow the future of British sovereignty. And Johnson, who today argues with himself from six months ago. Six months as Foreign Secretary, agreeing with Theresa May's um, so-called... Uh, Irish border arrangements. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's right today. He was wrong six months ago. They can't work. They will, they, will, they will never work. You know that. I know that. Everybody with a functioning cerebral cortex knows that. But Boris Johnson has decided that he has to completely contradict his own position of six months ago because, as ever, Boris Johnson is interested in one thing and one thing only. What's best for me? So, what was the other one? Who was the other one I just mentioned? Jane Kim, Bernard Jane Kim, Michael Gove, Boris Johnson, and Dominic Raab with this threat not to pay the bill is essentially saying we will abscond in the middle of the night, leaving huge debts behind us, and we fully ex expect any potential landlords in the future or anybody presiding over a buy-to-right scheme or any estate agents to whom we go seeking to buy a new home, we fully expect them to completely ignore the fact that we still owed 12 months' rent on the last place that we legged it from in the middle of the night after ripping out all the fixtures and fittings and, oh, I don't know, doing a massive poo in the middle of the sitting room floor. That, that is Dominic Raab's Brexit policy. And people are still going for it. So, the head of Jaguar Land Rover is a liar. The British way in the future will be to renege on any arrangements that we make. Boris Johnson is arguing with Boris Johnson about the Irish border. And Dominic Raab thinks that we should leg it in the middle of the night without paying our bills and fully expect any potential future landlords or estate agents to treat us with even more respect than they do now. And that, my friends, is Brexit. On, bear with me a moment, I don't have all these facts at my fingertips, on the 17th of September 2018. Monday the 17th of September 2018, the Brexit Secretary of State thinks we should leg it in the middle of the night without paying our bills. The Environment Secretary thinks that it is virtuous to talk of breaking promises and reneging on anything we arrange. The former Foreign Secretary, who six months ago agreed with the arrangements that Theresa May thinks she can deliver on the Irish border, today argues furiously that the arrangements that Theresa May thinks she can deliver on the Irish border are absolutely outrageous. And some bloke called Bernard Jenkins is touring the studio saying that he understands more about running international automotive companies than the head of Jaguar Land Rover, who he accuses essentially of lying. And still they cheer. Fish, blue passports. Your start of a 10 this morning is why. I I'm not very good at admitting that I'm wrong. I in many ways, I've made a career out of fu furiously refusing to admit that I'm ever wrong. It's only over the course of the last two or three years, arguably it's only really since Brexit, that I've come to see the importance of two things. Number one, saying the three most undervalued words in the English language. I don't know. And number two, recognising that you might be wrong about stuff. The examples I use with you seem trivial. But people who've listened to the programme for a while will know 
that actually undertaking these sort of U-turns is difficult for anybody. And, and, and while, you know, things like vegetarianism or um, mocking obese people or tattoos on public servants and all the other things that you've explained to me why I'm wrong about, I now recognise I am wrong about. But the biggest thing in my life politically that I've been wrong about would probably be, I, you'd probably reach for the Iraq war, Again, I, I don't think that the disaster that unfolded after the toppling of Saddam Hussein necessarily renders the entire Gulf War to uh, a wrong decision. But as you look back at the uh, manipulated intelligence, and of course, if it had all gone well after the toppling of Saddam Hussein, no one would be looking at the manipulated intelligence. I still think I could make a case for when you've got 10 murderous dictators lined up against a wall and you have a choice of taking out one, or one of them or none of them. I still think I could make a case for that. But politically, that's probably the biggest thing that I personally have had to acknowledge I got wrong. Um, because I didn't have a crystal ball, so I'm, I'm not going to beat myself up about it. Brexit is different. Brexit is so obviously wrong before it's even happened that I want you to talk to me today about the psychology, okay? The psychology. Because the, 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 the more bovine wing of Brexit support now has, as I told you it would, moved away from making claims about things are going to be okay and doubled down almost unanimously on please stop talking about it, please shut up, please stop. It's amazing how quickly it's gone from we won, get over it, you lost, get over it. We've gone from sunny uplands, they need us more than we need them, to you lost, get over it, to shut up, please stop talking about it. Please stop holding up a mirror in which I cannot avoid my own idiocy. So why do people find it so hard to admit? Why can't? And I don't mean... Well, actually, no, I do mean you as much as I mean um, the prominent Brexiters. But it's the psychology of the people on the telly and the radio that intrigues me more. Because I sit in a studio for three hours every day. And I, I try to conceive of the circumstances in which I could sit here and say... Look, I, as a gob on a stick with a, with a degree in philosophy and economics and, and uh, you know, a, a career trying to understand stuff but not always succeeding, the moment I would sit in this studio and say to you, oh, yes, the head of Jaguar Land Rover is making it up. I am a backbench MP and I know more than he does. Or the minute I could sit in a studio, look you in the eye and say, don't worry if this doesn't look good, even though I'm one of the people that told you it would be brilliant. It's not brilliant. It's a bit rubbish, but we're going to agree to it and then we're going to break all our promises. This is the psychology that intrigues me. Michael Gove essentially trying to turn lying or uh, untrustworthiness into a virtue. Bernard Jenkin essentially casting himself as knowing more about the internal running of Jaguar Land Rover than the man who internally runs Jaguar Land Rover. Boris Johnson needs a bit of a backseat on this because uh, the idea of discussing Boris Johnson's deceit and dissembling is a little bit like discussing the alleged Catholicism of the Pope or the lavatorial habits of bears in woods. And then Dominic Raab, the Brexit secretary, tooling around the place, looking like the evil twin of that bloke that used to run the holiday camp in Heidi High, and claiming that it would somehow be a good thing to announce to the world that we don't pay our bills and we can't be trusted. So those people, when you look at these people, these prominent Brexiters, every single promise they've made has, has fallen apart at the seams before we've even left. And you with an understanding of humanity, human nature, psychology. Sorry, I'm going on a bit. I'll stop now. Give me a call. Interrupt me for God's sake. Otherwise I'll be here till one o'clock. Give me a call and tell me what, what it is that makes it so impossible for them to recognise their own ridiculousness. How can you sit in a studio saying any of the things that we've just listed without a little voice in the back of your head going, oh, mate. Psychological, not political, has become something of a byword or catchphrase for some of our Brexit discussions. But, but today it's in really, really stark relief. And I want your insights into how four, well, three and a half prominent politicians. I'm not sure Boris Johnson deserves that description. I'm not sure he ever has, actually, but we are where we are. Can sit in studios and say things that just three short years ago could have been career-ending in their borderline corruption and base idiocy. The Brexit secretary suggesting that we would abscond in the middle of the night 
from our financial obligations to the European Union in the event of no deal, as if that would not automatically torpedo any chances of being trusted on the world stage. That, that chap's called Rob. Boris Johnson arguing with himself from six months ago, um, in public, in a newspaper column, in a newspaper owned by men who not only own the Daily Telegraph, but also own the tenancy of their own Channel Island and the Ritz Hotel. When I come to write my PhD on the, on the madness of the last couple of years, I think the idea of the men who own the Ritz somehow bankrolling uh, a campaign that claimed to be opposed to the elites, I think that's going to be a whole chapter. Uh, Michael Gove trying to turn dishonesty and untrustworthiness into a virtue, and Bernard Jenkin, a, a, a ridiculous backbencher who, uh, by the absurdity of Brexit, achieves prominence because so few people can put their head above the parapet with such astonishing absence of self-awareness, claims to understand the workings of Jaguar Land Rover better than the man who runs Jaguar Land Rover. What do you think explains such weapons-grade stubbornness and denial of reality? That's what I want to hear. Adam is in Reading. Adam, you can tell us. Well, I hope you can, but it's quite a big ask. I do accept that. OK, sorry, James. Thanks for putting me on. It's the uh, first time on the show, but I am, um, first of all, um, I used to work for Jaguar Land Rover. OK. Um, and actually within the strategy department. Um, so there's certain things I can't tell you, but um, one thing I would actually sort of point out is actually um, there's nothing actually in relation to Ralph Spate's character and integrity, which I don't think that the, the vast majority of the, the human, uh, well, the British people should actually, uh, well, doubt. Um, I think one of the things which you sort of think, see is actually a lot of the analysis within the card industry is not actually done at the mega level, it's actually done at the uh, sort of minute level. Yes. Um, we're talking literally, you know, a company which has probably done its Brexit investigations three three years earlier. Yes. So, you know, there's been a lot of preparation behind this. And, and preparation and think, for, for almost all imaginable case scenarios, even the ones that in a rational universe would be unimaginable. Uh, well, yeah, and, and I think one of the things you sort of have to look at, James, is, first of all, there, are 20, there were 27 particular scenarios for Brexit. Good grief. <laughs> um, I didn't so, know that. Well, there, there were. So that's, and, uh, that's 17 million people voting for 27 different options, but we're still buying into the nonsense of the will of the people. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> 27. And, uh, so you need to divide 17 million by 27 and then tot up the results of the referendum with, with, with 28 <laughs> different case scenarios, yeah. the 27 possible Brexits, yeah. uh, and then Remain. And it's quite a resounding victory for Remain. Which, uh, oh, dear, we shouldn't laugh. So, so yeah, you, you, you can't really laugh. But, um, you know, but, but, the, but the fundamental difference is that, uh, James, and I say I'm going to use uh, publicly quoted information. Of course. Yeah, because I know no, no longer here. Um, but I think one of the things you have to sort of understand about the um, the car parts industry, in particularly, um, cars built up. It's a essentially it's a large Meccano set with uh, you know probably six to eight thousand parts. Um, you know we don't necessarily in the UK have all of that ma manufacturing capability, and as a result of that, you'd probably be looking at the vast majority of those goods like themselves actually being being actually. Uh, produced within the EU. Um, but but this is so this is sorry, sorry to interrupt you because I, I think we're going to nod along here a bit. You 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 describe very calmly and coolly what you as a as a former worker in the strategy department at Jaguar Land Rover. I'm just going to take a brief moment to, to blow the trumpet of the program. We're having a chat about an MP who claims that he understands the workings of the strategy of Jaguar Land Rover better than the bloke who runs Jaguar Land Rover. We don't book people unless we have to on the program because we know that someone like Adam will ring in. First caller comes from a former um, strategist at Jaguar Land Rover. But, but what you're describing is so self-evident and to you presumably obvious that, that rather than go over it all again, I'd love to know what you think explains the psychology psychology of someone today like Bernard Jenkins standing up and saying he understands Jaguar Land Rover better than Ralph Spieth does, or, to be less charitable, calling Ralph Spieth a liar? Um, well, two options. One is basically lack of understanding or knowledge, um, which I would probably number one, is that number one. 
number two. But if you've a, got a lack of understanding and knowledge, you should shut up, shouldn't you? And, and get a, get some understanding and knowledge and then chip in your thoughts and opinions. Um, that's, that's the sort of principles I would normally work to, James. Yeah. But, you know, that's, that's one thing. But I think the second one is possibly an ancient Chinese principle, really, of saving face. And unfortunately, we're in that sort of rabbit hole at this moment in time. Saving I should face. be mentioning, you know, where where we can't actually, we're, we're in a position now where whereby even when you were going to leave the EU, there wasn't any negotiating uh, uh, you know, power on the, on the part of the UK. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, you know, in order to basically do that, the only thing you can actually now pop, pop up is basically blame, uh, etc. You know, we've got... But how how do they save face? They save face by postponing the humiliation. Is that what you're saying? Because, I mean, what happens as a former... And, and the phone line's not great. And uh, I think... Have you been for your jog already this morning, Adam? Is that... You say, yeah. Well, we. Well, yes. Um, well, actually, I'm in the middle of. Uh, I'm in the. Uh, well, I'm, I actually had to stop off at a lay by. Good man. No, I appreciate. It. I really do. But but here's the thing. <sighs> when it happens, if we crash out with no deal whatsoever, what happens to Jaguar Land Rover's supply chain the next morning? Okay. Uh, well, next next morning, it's, there, 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 are, there are two principal things, first of all. One is in relation to the level of tariffs. Um, number one, as you can probably see worldwide, WTO tariffs, which I think you're, which one of your, your yeah. uh, one of your recent things. So, you know, you're talking about 10%. Um, first of all, on... To get the stuff uh, out of the bit, out of the country. Yeah, exactly. And what about yeah, getting stuff into the country, the JIT? Uh, well, well, exactly. Uh, well, basically, customs je- checks. We've got. There's no certainty of what, basically, custom checks are going to go in there. Actually, if you look at... It, it, has, to, it has to fit EU standard. Oh, jeez. We, yeah, we're no, going no, no, to no. hit the line. You've had a really good crack of the whip. I would give you a Ray Liotta, I think, um, yeah. uh, in ordinary yeah. circumstances, but I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to introduce anything remote comical to our Brexit contemplations. Adam, we'll talk again. I, I, you've, had, you've had the whole of the second chunk of the programme, but I could listen to you for, for, for another 20 minutes. Do you know why? Because some people in this country have not had enough of experts. I, you know, every time I toy with the idea of doing the entire three hours uninterrupted on Brexit without any callers, almost as a sort of entry for the Guinness World Book of, Book of World Records, I take a caller like the last one and realise that compared to some people, I know nothing. Compared to someone who worked in the strategy department at Jaguar Land Rover, I don't know much about the strategy of Jaguar Land Rover. But Bernard Jenkins thinks he knows more than the man who runs Jaguar Land Rover. And that's what we're discussing today. The psychology of the senior Brex, Brex dreamists, Brexiters, whatever you want to call them, that allows them to, to stare at the sun and tell you it's the moon. It, that's what I want to understand. Dominic Raab, trying to turn it into a virtue that he thinks we should abscond in the middle of the night with our bills unpaid without knowing where we're going. That's the fundamental upshot of saying, well, we won't pay the bill. We won't keep our financial responsibilities. But loads and loads of new trading partners will be queuing up to sign agreements with us the day after that we've broken the terms of the last ones we signed, the biggest ever. Um, Gove on telly yesterday claiming that we can change our minds later. Let's just sign a deal now and then break, you know, then renege on it later. And that's what our country has been reduced to by these people. So I'm less interested today in why people are still failing to see through these clowns, these charlatans. And I'm more interested in how they manage, not to sleep at night, that would be a bit too glib a question, but how they manage to to sit in studios, which is the, the shop window of political life. They sit in studios and say things that even three years ago would have been career ending in their stupidity and their dishonesty. How can they not see that? Or can they see it? So that's what I mean by it being psychological, not political. And I thought that the the saving face line in the last call is probably actually much, much bigger than we realise. David's in Romford. David, what would you like to say? Uh, um, Thanks for taking my call. You're very welcome, but we're going to have to do something about that phone line. Brian is in Newton Stewart in uh, in Scotland. Brian, what would you like to say? Hello. um, My thought about what they're basically thinking is essentially just holding on to power at all costs because the r- once the cat was let out the bag and there was the first referendum, mm. by the time there was a, if there's going to be a public vote, a people's vote second referendum, the result of that actually in my mind only leads 
to one thing, and I'm basing this roughly on the aftermath of the Scottish referendum. Yes. When a minority can end up extremely powerful in the first past the post general election, and what I'm thinking is, if you've got even the Brexit pro Brexit side lost a second vote theoretically second vote and ended up with 40% didn't yes. to, to leave Europe that 40% would then do now the, similar to what the indie referendum yes voters did rally round behind their one voice which in our case was the SNP but in the worst case scenario would be a Brexiter's one voice left would be UKIP. Right. And even if it was a 40% minority that wanted to leave Europe in a second referendum, that would whitewash and annihilate Westminster come the next general election. Because of no, you're, you're giving them too much credit. Bernard Jenkin is not sitting in a studio today <laughs> claiming to know more about running Jaguar Land Rover than the man who runs Jaguar Land Rover because of a slightly... Uh, uh, well, not even slightly, because of, a, because of complicated arithmetic. Well... No. I don't, I don't, no. Mm. But Boris Johnson is not using his column in the Daily Telegraph to argue with Boris Johnson from six months there, ago because he's, because he's frightened of power. UKIP. He's probably going to join them next. That's, that was exactly my thought. I know, but it's not why. They, the, the psychology of it is, is, is what I'm interested in. How can they stare at the sun and tell voters it's a moon? Greed. Just power. Greed for power more than... But greed someone for like wealth. Jacob rees and Bernard Jenkins haven't got any power. I suppose they get... I mean, yes, Jacob... Yes, they don't yet. But just what you said about them possibly, the thought of jumping ship, you know, to a UKIP... They would rule it, obviously, a 40% swing in a general election. No, there wouldn't you be. No, 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 not, the, not the idea. I mean, I'd, I'd love you to be right. I'd love to think that there was actually a logical, rational explanation. But, it, but you're overlooking two things. Number one, the, <laughs> you're saying, essentially, that they know that they're talking absolute hogwash, but they also think they've got a very good reason for doing so. I, 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 I don't think they know that they're talking absolute hogwash. That's why I'm so interested in the psychology of it. There's a sun. And they're sure it's a moon. How can they be so sure? Back to saving face. Imagine if you had spent, and I'm, I'm very good friends uh, historically, going right back to, to my early teenage years with, with the family of one of the country's most prominent Eurosceptics. You, you, I'm a really good guy, honest, decent, long before Euroscepticism got hijacked by fag packet fascists and racists and, and, and so-called outright loonies when it was a, a sort of noble, slightly exceptionalist um, anachronism, but, but, but a noble-ish one. And that's an entire lifetime, an entire career dedicated to the notion that there's a monster in the wardrobe. This was where uh, claims that the European Union represented some sort of um, uh, Fourth Reich began, when the idea was that this organisation somehow operated against our interests. And if you've spent 30 or 40 years dedicating your, your, not just your career, but much of your life to warning people about the monster in the wardrobe and promising to slay it, and then the country votes to open the wardrobe doors, and there's no monster in there, just some clothes, what do you do? Well, if you're Bernard Jenkin, Michael Gove, Boris Johnson, Dominic Robb, you start swearing blind there's a monster hiding behind the clothes. And I think that's where we are now. But they must know that there isn't. Strange times. 10.41. Back to Romford. Give David's phone line another chance. David, what would you like to say? Hello? David, what's on your mind? Yeah, right. Um, basically, I want to speak about Britain's new place in the world um, post-Brexit. Yeah. Rogue Nation Supremo. Um, I mean, we're already in embarrassment in Africa. I mean, Brexiteers were trying to spin that... We'd already signed a trade deal with when Mrs. May went around. I think it was South Africa, she, she Kenya, or the, Nigeria. I'm the, not sure. Well, there were there were a However, few there were a few countries. But uh, as as you're about to remind us, what what they were encouraging us to celebrate was an agreement from some economically almost irrelevant African countries that we could carry on trading with them exactly the same as we do now. So the great cause for celebration was actually the status quo. You're quite right. Yes, and. Um, yeah, it materialised at this 
you know, the, the so-called deal that was signed by, I think it was, was it... Um, I'll tell you, David, Bob, with the greatest of love and respect, mate, I'd kinda, I'm going to advise you just to swat up slightly on what it is you've rang in to tell me, the, the countries and who signed it and what it was that they signed, because I already know. <laughs> and I don't, I don't want to sound rude, but if you don't, I'm not quite sure what use we are to each other at this point in proceedings. Nick's in Cheltenham. Nick, what would you like to say? Oh, hello. I hello. hope I don't get too tongue-tied and... Uh, I'm, I'm this, sure. but, well, have, have you thought of having a quick drink before you uh, come on out? No, no. Uh, um, it's about the rational mind being yes. overruled, which I think is what, what could be happening. And that, that I think it be, is, yes. I think yes, that's exactly by, by what it instinct, is. instincts, just, just ruling out your, your mind, it's just instinct or, or phobia. And I, I've noticed that um, with someone like Jacob Rees-Mogg, there's um, a, a real narrative of slavery. It's as if the country is, is a slave to this, going to be a slave to this vassal state. Yes. And we can't make any of our laws. Other people tell us what to do and yes. we're losing control. And it, it's in the psychology of this country in, in a certain way, because in, in cricket matches even, you get rule Britannia, Britons, Britons never will be slaves on the trumpet, you know, and yes. then the last night of the proms. So you think there's a, 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 I mean, a, an irrational fear of being enslaved? Yes. And Gosh, you're rather uh, good. U UKIP has been in existence for 25 years, and just by coincidence, William Wilberforce took 21 years <laughs> to get slavery <laughs> ab abolished. And there are all sorts of um, things about the economy being wrecked if you liberate yourself from slavery. Um, um, p people saying, oh, and this was in the American Civil War as well, the Confederates said, oh, if we get rid of slavery, our economy will be absolutely ruined. And um, William IV, um, 40 years before he became king in the House of Lords, said, oh, we'll lose our Royal Navy because the Merchant Navy will be wrecked. Is that true? Yeah, yes. But that it's, would be a... Ra I mean, they, they would be... Wouldn't they be economic forecasts? <laughs> yeah, 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 yes, this, this, this was... Um, the, the people who were um, wanting to abolish slavery were, were faced by Project Fear. Um, he, he lists um, sort of um, six or seven things that, w that would, would go wrong. Um, Gosh. We'd, we'd e even um, we'd lose our empire, and um, we'd, um, the dignity and prosper prosperity of the nation would would go, and the, uh, and, and so on. And, Gosh, that um, is an amazing historical comparison. I, I, thought, I thought you might have been on fairly thin ice when you compared the 25 years of UKIP to the 21 years of the abolitionist fruition. Well, if you've fruition. been campaigning for something for years and years and years and years and years, yes. and then, then, then someone very near the end says, oh, well, it's a nice idea, but um, the, the economy would be wrecked, you, you don't give up then, because it, you, you're, you're carrying on on instinct. So are, are, we, are we to derive some Brexit-flavoured optimism from you then? Because um. <laughs> I, I think I've understood the point that you're making, but to take it to its 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 natural conclusion, you you be no, you wouldn't quite. This is where the analogy no, falls no, no, down, no, isn't it, it? Yes, it doesn't quite work. No, when I I voted to, for Remain, I voted on, on instinct in, in many ways. I didn't know all the economic the calculations here. and so on. I was gloriously I unqualified. Peace in Europe. Peace in Europe seemed a fairly attractive prospect to me, but um, equally, so the identity of some of the people lining up on the other side of the fence probably played a bigger part in my vote than than my understanding of the complicated issues. So you well, see, there you, is you, you, were, you, were, you you base that on instinct of people. Yes, I did. Um, it's quite quite interesting. Boris Johnson uh, talked about um, letterbox uh, uh, um, uh, burkas looking like yes. letterboxes and so on. And because it was Boris Johnson, was, uh, and I think rightly uh, that that was a uh, a very bad thing. Yes. But um, when Bernard Cribbins in um, the film um, Carry On Spying in 1964, yes. which was the year that Boris Johnson was born, so he may have particularly looked at that film to say, oh, what Carry On film was coming out when I was born. Go on. Bernard, but when Bernard Cribbins went, went into um, a kind of um, harem or, or something with um, Barbara Windsor, yes. Bernard Cribbins all dressed up like that, he says, um, well, it's all right for you. You don't have to go in dressed like a letterbox. Oh, gosh. So I guess Boris Johnson might have... He, Th throwing, throwing his cultural, but, refer his but cultural that, references that came out the year he was born coming from 1964 and carry I, on I guess film. he might have picked that up and says oh I can say that as a joke and that would but, be but his when defense when Cribben says it you hardly, I didn't notice it the first time I saw it then I heard Boris Johnson say it and then um, 
when I saw it a second time, I thought, hang on a minute. <laughs> there we I go. Noticed it. Well, I don't uh, think it's beyond the realms of possibility that Boris Johnson gets his lines from, from Bernard Cribbins in 1964 Carry On Fields. Nick, I, I'm, I'm a little late for the break, but I, may I just say thank you? I, I, for the, actually, the fruits of your thoughtfulness will nourish me for the rest of the day. Right. <laughs> no, I mean it. to you and your family. Oh, you're, what a nice man. Thank you, Nick. And the same to you and yours. 10.47 is the time. Here's something that I haven't thought of before. It's from a, a, a Palmer. Um, that's a very formal way of signing a text. I approve. So would Jacob Rees-Mogg. Uh, it seems that the Tug Forlock Brigade are on the up, and we are being taken back into ownership by the ruling class. Is that where deference leads? Is that because that's the one thing I'll never get my head around? But. Even when you watch something like Downton Abbey, the, the hierarchies below stairs are, if anything, even more rigorously enforced than the hierarchies above stairs. So, so the, I don't think it's a uniquely British disposition, it, although it may have an English flavour to it. Do, do, is, is there a significant sway of the population that actually just wants somebody posh to come along and give them a cuddle and tell them everything's going to be OK? The sort of class-based equivalence of the American nightmare at the moment, where, where somebody off the telly who, who claimed to be very, very rich promised to give them all a cuddle and, and, and make everything all right. Is, is, there, is there an element of that? If Jacob Rees-Mogg had a regional accent, he wouldn't have got arrested in this country. His, his entire shtick is built upon his exaggerated patrician demeanour. And because we are quite a deferential country, another big discovery I've made since Brexit, I always thought we were the opposite. I thought everyone was like me. I, I, you know, no one's better than me by birth. I refuse to, to, to curtsy or kowtow or bow to somebody as a result of an accident of birth. I respect people according to their actions, not according to their biology. But we do seem to live in a country where an awful lot of people think that if you can just about finesse the pantomime toff approach, it's a bit like why UKIP used to dress as weird gamekeepers from a sort of... Royston Vasey Tribute Act. Do you remember every time you saw someone from UKIP, they'd be dressed in tweeds. You said, "Why are you dressed in tweeds? You live in Basildon. You've, you've, you've never been shooting in your life." My friends who go shooting, they generally wear clothes that are between two or three hundred years old and handed down by scions of their aristocratic families. UKIP dressed like kind of weird. Almost like an American idea of what an American toff would look like. Uh, a British toff, an English toff would look like. And that's the same sort of thing, because they perhaps understood that there was a significant sway of the British population, that if you just sort of wore tweeds and, and, and guffawed a bit, they'd think you knew what you were talking about. So the, the ludicrous tweed jackets of UKIP lead inexorably to the mediocre tailoring of Jacob rees suits and the very painstakingly honed Patrician, he's not even reading a real accent, that, is it? At some point, I, got, I know people who are in the same year as him at Eton who don't sound anything like him. Listen to Prince William. Listen to Prince William talk. Prince William's posh, right? He's posher than you, posher than me. That's, that's about as posh as you can realistically be if you haven't sat down at any point in your life and gone, I'm going to make a conscious effort to sound like I am a refugee from the 19th century. That, that, that's how it happens. You see it a few times. Duncan Smith's accent's very similar as well. This is a, a, an area of enduring fascination to me because I was very conscious of my accent growing up because I went to a posh school where you'd get picked up on for not being posh enough. And then, of course, almost everywhere else I ever went in life, you'd get teased a bit for being posh. I think I was about 25 or 26 before I actually found my natural accent. I bumped into an old mate of mine the other day. You might have seen him on the telly, William Sitwell, who's a, oh, he's got a beautiful voice. He's a judge on one of those... TV shows, edit, Edits, Waitrose, Food Illustrated, and he started teasing me about having gone the other way. So I was teasing him about sounding so posh, and he said, well, I talk like you used to. <laughs> I never quite talk like that. But when I was on the William Hickey column at the Express, I would change my accent according to who I was talking to. I've told you this story a billion times. I hung up on the Marcus of Bath and put a call into Pete Tong, the superstar DJ, and my accent went about 180 degrees in the inter... OK, Alexander, take care, Pip, Pip, see you soon, God, God bless... Hey, mate, yeah, it's O'Brien on the Express. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pathetic, but, you know, I was a kid. And I know, that's how I know that these people have sat down and tried to sound posher than they really are. 
And I used to think they were ridiculous. Now I think maybe they were onto this all along. No, what you don't understand, James, a significant swathe of the British population won't pay any attention at all to what I'm saying if I say it in a posh accent. Go back to some of the clips on the LBC website of when Brexiters ring in and soil themselves on air and look at the reaction from the gammon. So if it's someone who has a regional accent or who sounds a bit salt of the earth, they will claim that the calls were staged or specially selected for being stupid or something like that. If, if, if you... Um, I've got that the wrong way around. If they sound salt of the earth regional accent, they've been specially selected for being stupid. But if they sound posh or middle class, they're, they're fake callers that we've somehow paid actors to pretend to be. Because Gammon can't get their head around the idea that people who sound posh can be just as thick as them. They kind of need to live by the notion that someone who sounds really, really posh... And if you wanted to pick the two most fraudulent um, champions of Brexit, you'd probably go for a man who changed his name from Alexander to Boris in order to sound posher to plebs, and a man who has finessed his own accent to sound posher than the Queen because he knows that it plays well with plebs, Jacob Rees-Mogg and Boris Johnson. So, so Gammon can't quite compute that somebody posh can be just as dumb as they are, and that perhaps is the key to understanding how Brexit has ended up where it is. God, I do all this for free. Amanda's in Mill Hill. Amanda, what can you tell us? Well, first of all, I can't stop laughing. I've got a relatively posh voice, yes. and I'm a brunette, so evidently anything I'm going to say must be accurate. Absolutely. Surely, I yeah? already believe you. <laughs> so, I'm going to answer your question in the way that you've asked it, from a purely psychotherapeutic perspective, oh, good. as a psychotherapist, yes. okay? Yes. I'm not going to get involved in any of the politics. No. I think it's as simple as this. If you get caught cheating, you catch your husband cheating, it questions his entire integrity. Yes. Therefore, you start to think, did he lie to me about X, Y, and Z? And you have your little mind going back over the years, questioning everything. I think that the whole situation with Brexit, and I voted Remain just based on a modicum of common sense, not having enough details and worrying about our economy. So yes. evidently, my brunette hair held me in good stead. Um, but I think it calls a question to the entire government, all their decisions, shows a light on their integrity, and therefore they're standing there, guilty as hell, going, oh, no, 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 we didn't do it, because the repercussions of them actually having the honesty of saying, yeah, we screwed up, would be enormous. That's what I think. So it's, it's, it's denial to avoid, it's denial of a, of a, of a medium-sized truth in order to avoid acknowledging an absolutely humongous truth. I think, yeah. I think it shows just how insecure we are as a country. I think it shows a light to... And that's the why they're the same, they're the same people banging on about what a wonderful, strong country we are, the ones who are actually insecure about it because it's a case of that me thinks the lady doth protest too much. Well, if you want another therapeutic perspective... Secure people this. don't need to tell you that they're secure. Strong people Absolutely. don't need to tell you that they're strong, do they? A Absolutely. And also, the thing that you most note or say about others is invariably the thing that's true about yourself. You are somewhere on the continuum. So if they are arguing the talk, saying the country is so secure, it's yes. because they know inside, in the, you know, if they have any integrity, which I see well, sadly key, doubt. Well, that is the key question now, isn't it? I think that's the question, and I think that's the thing. I think it's absolute fear. Everyone hates change. Everyone's scared of it. I think they didn't think through the whole thing. They were re Everyone was really gung-ho and stupidly excited for no reason. And they can't and admit it now, because to admit that would cast doubt on pretty much yeah. every aspect yeah. of their professional yeah. and, and personal yeah. existence. And also, is, is there an element in when the wife who has been cheated on somehow tries to blame the mistress rather than the husband? There's a bit of that uh -huh. going on here as well. It's all, yes, 100%, because it's all about never accept. People cannot take responsibility for their actions. And our government, I personally would have much more respect if they went, whoops, or let's go to the country again, or let's have another, you know, let's just give people the facts as they are and have people ha make an honest and informed decision. Yes, can't, than can't do that, because, if, yeah, because then the fact that I was talking utter, utter horlicks right yeah. up until June 2016 will become unavoidable and undeniable and my entire life, 30, 40 year careers we're talking about here Completely. Will, will be and shown I, to have been built yeah. on utter, utter nonsense. The egg on my face is just, I could never wash it off. Yeah, yeah, although 
Ah, oh, the egg on my face, I could never wash it off. No, I, I've, got, I've got no wool, though. Amanda, it's probably because you are... How did you describe yourself? Quite posh and have brown hair, so I have to hang upon your every word. Consider my cap doffed and my forelock tugged. We move on now to something completely different. Um, a story that... 